Okay, um, welcome back to uh, Introductory Sociology. Today uh, we're going to have the uh, study session, the review for the final exam, which will be on Tuesday around 9.30, I think, to 11 o'clock. And as usual, you'll, you can have as much time as you want to take the exam, but most of you will get it done in about 40 minutes or so, because it's not any longer than the previous ones. Uh, as usual, you'll need a blue book and uh, follow the same instructions for the first two exams. Uh, unless it's a true or false type of question, you want to answer these in a couple of sentences, two or three sentences. And if I ask the difference between two things, that means to find them both. So, um, <clears throat> and also just keep in mind the last day of class, your, your final uh, papers are due. And you're welcome to record this. I'm recording it as well, and I'll post it probably tomorrow after it takes a while to come. It takes about 30 minutes for me to convert this file to a YouTube format, so I usually do it the next day. Anyway, um, let's talk about um, what you need to know for the final. Um, yeah, and you're welcome to put your recording devices up here if you'd like to do that. Uh, okay, so um, you need to know the correlation between age and voter turnout. Basically, here we're looking at a positive correlation. As people get older, they're more likely to vote. And on the flip side, when people are younger, they're less likely to vote. Um, you don't need to explain the reasons because it's not obvious that there is a clear reason, but for whatever reason, younger people are less likely to vote. Um, you can sign in and grab a copy of the study guide if you didn't get one last time. Okay, you need to know what charismatic authority is. And like I said in the previous two exams, all of these answers can be found in the PowerPoints and, all, and in the recorded lecture and in, the, in your book. So any kind of a definition will be in the glossary. But charismatic authority is authority that is rooted in the, personal, uh, the personality of the leader, uh, having a magnetic personality. And it's not necessarily good or bad, because like I said before, Hitler had charismatic authority, and he wasn't a, um, a good person, obviously, and um, JFK had it as well. Um, so you need to know what next, uh, what rational legal authority is. And um, we said rational legal authority is authority that is, that is vested in, the, um, uh, in a government system that sets it up uh, like the presidency. Um, so, um, and you can look these up in, in the back of your book, and I'd suggest that when you prepare for the exam, you, you try to use some flashcards or have somebody quiz you, uh, and so on. Um, okay, you need to know the functionalist view of the nation state. Functionalist, and by a nation state, I mean the c countries. Um, Functionalists believe that nation states are useful. They give it a thumbs up because without a nation state, life would be nasty, brutish, and short. There'd be violence and chaos. And so the view of human nature here is that we need some restraint. We need a government to rule and regulate the citizens. If we didn't have a, if we just lived in a place with no formal government, it would be a anarchy. Uh, and so functionalists uh, support the nation state. Okay, um, you need to know under, uh, the, 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 this is going at the difference between authoritarian and totalitarian. Um, we said in a totalitarian regime is one where the government totally controls all aspects of the citizens' lives and there's hardly any freedom of, at all. So Nazi Germany had a totalitarian state. But what about, and R Russia, uh, communist Russia, what about Iraq under Saddam Hussein? Was, would that be totalitarian or a uh, or authoritarian. It'd be authoritarian because under authoritarian government uh, you have a dictator that that allows some degrees of freedom. Um, so most of the, in fact today I think arguably the only totalitarian state there is, what would you guess? North Korea, yeah. Um, would probably be the only one that you could classify that way. Okay, um, you need to know what, what percent of voters uh, actually voted in, in 1996. Uh, so basically, it's, all, it's a 51%, but it's, it, it always tends to be about half of eligible voters in the United States turn out to vote. In other words, half of the people who could vote just don't bother with it. Um, 
Voting is higher in presidential elections, uh, as though, but not much. Okay, um, you need to know what a monopoly is. A monopoly exists when one company crushes all the competition and totally controls the market for a product or a service. Um, now, in some cases, it's not so much that they crushed it, they crushed it but it's just that, like, say, utilities. Um, phone service is, is changing, but say, like, uh, electricity. I mean, if you, get, if you have electricity in Clovis, there's only one choice. Uh, same with water. Uh, that's government decision. Uh, but that's a monopoly. But a, an example of a monopoly would be back when... Um, steel? Steel? Carnegie Steel, yeah, or the um, back when Microsoft, there was a time where Microsoft drove Netscape Navigator out of the market, so they had the, in practice, it was the only browser you could get. It's not that way any, in fact, um, I haven't done a count, but uh, how many browsers approximately are there now? I mean, I know there's about six or seven mainstream ones, but I think there are a lot more than that. I mean, you've got Chrome, you've got Firefox, Opera, Safari, I, Internet, what? It's not Internet Explorer anymore. My, Microsoft Edge, yeah. yeah. So, um, okay. Adam Smith argued that individual capitalists will always be motivated to provide the goods and services desired by the public at a price they're willing to pay. Why would they do that? Well, the key thing here is that, well, think about it this way. Why is it that? Um, Oh, say you went to a bigger city. Where it's, why is it, say, that um, a tire store w would give you a bargain on a tire? So you come back and, so you come back and so the, yeah, the key thing here is, is competition. This is the invisible hand. That, so the idea here is that um, if a company or business doesn't do that, if a company gives you a lousy product at a really high price, what happens to them? Right, because people stop shopping there. They won't. They won't go there normally. Although in economics, there's something called the, what is it? The, forgetting the term. But basically, so there are some people who buy overly expensive products because it makes them look cool or, or some. What's the, the? Oh, the snob factor. So like, some people will buy a T-shirt that costs fifty bucks, even though it's not worth fifty bucks because it it, it might impress other people. Um, but generally, though, people buy products that are, that are a good price, and, and they buy them looking for good quality. And companies who aren't willing to, to, to do that, they are less likely to succeed. So competition is really the answer. It's the key there. Adam Smith called it the invisible hand. All right, you need to know how downsizing might have a bad effect on companies. Downsizing is where a company lays off employers, employees in order to try to... to um, improve their profits, their bottom line. Now, we said there are a lot of possible negative effects, but a reduction in employee loyalty could be one negative effect. That is, if, if you're in a company and they just lay people off to try to save money, it's going to reduce... Um, in fact, does anyone remember Circuit City? It's a, they, they're out of business now, but well, one of their things they did is they had employees who had been working there like five or six years, and so they had a slightly higher wage, and they laid them off and said, we'll hire you back at starting salary. You know, and some of them took that deal. Um, so, um, but of course, it, it reduced employee morale and employee loyalty. All right, you need to know what is the difference between the sacred and the profane. This is a religious term. And it has, by the way, profane in this sense has nothing to do with profanity. Um, sacred are things that have special religious significance, like the cross of Christ, the Bible, things like that. What is the profane? Non-religious. Non-religious. Things, things that have no specific religious meaning, like uh, the, the microphone on the desk here, the iPhone, or or your fingernails, or, uh, th basically things that are, uh, that are not of a religious nature. Um, okay, you need to know, according to the functionalist perspective, what is one of the functions of religion? Um, and again, you don't have to know all of the functions. Social, uh, social unity, it, it, it promotes slow social change. It, yeah, it gives meaning to life that 
You know, as I said before, one, one way to look at things that happen is like that, remember the movie Forrest Gump and he had that sticker that said shit happens? Basically, that some, sometimes, I mean, you, you could look at things that happen and just say, well, it just randomly happened, but religion ascribes meaning to things that is often more, more comforting and, uh, and fulfilling. Um, okay, uh, you should, um, okay, Karl Marx claimed that religion is the opiate of the masses. What did Marx mean by that? And, and literally, opiate is a narcotic. Progress, slow, slow social change and progress, it delays what he could. Marx was looking for something called the revolution of the proletariat, where they overthrew all the rich people and replaced them with a communist dictatorship, and eventually that would be phased out. But basically, for Marx, when he said the religion is the opiate of the masses, it's like taking a drug to, to reduce your pain, but not really dealing with the underlying cause. So like you broke your leg, and if the doctor, all he did was gave you narcotic pain medication without you know, fixing the bone, that wouldn't be good. And so Marx, he meant this in a negative, in a sarcastic way. He was attacking religion, and not just Christianity. Any religion felt was, was, was of the bad, uh, negative thing. Did you have a comment? Basically, to keep people calm? Well, to keep people calm, passive, and sheep-like. Uh, so he meant it in the sense that um, people should be fighting for their rights and trying to, to get a better income, et cetera, but the religion tells them to put up with a lot of abuse because if they're passive, they, they'll get a better reward in the afterlife. Okay, um, you need to know, okay, Max Weber wrote the book called The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism. You need to know which religious group especially illustrated this ethic. Was it the Catholics, the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Jews, or the Calvinist? Anyone recall? Remember, they had, he, he's talking about the, the religion that had this... The Calvinists. The Calvinist, because they had this belief of predestination, which we talked about, and you can go back and watch that lecture again. And so here, you just need to know, it was the Calvinist. Um, although they don't really call themselves Calvinists today, but they would be called Reformed, uh, Reformed churches. Um, okay, um, what is a sect? You need to provide the definition based on the textbook or lecture. A sect is a religious group that is broken off from its parent organization in an attempt to reform or, or either retain old traditions. Um, and so, um, what would, the, the, I mentioned before that uh, in Vatican II, I think this was what, in the 70s, maybe 60s, where the Catholic Church made some changes and some people didn't like those changes and they broke away and formed their own uh, group, and so that would be an example of a sect. I might be wrong, but it could be the Byzantine or Byzantine, I'm maybe pronouncing that wrong. But here, you just need to know the definition. You don't have to give an example. Although, as an aside, if in any case where your definition is a little bit weak, but you've got a strong example, that can allow you to get full points. Um, so, um, okay, what is a cult? What is, how does the, does anyone have your book handy? How does the book define a cult in the back? In the, it's in your glossary, alphabetically organized. A cult, it's a religious organization whose characteristics are not down. Drawn? Drawn from existing religious traditions within society. Right, it's, so it's a, a, it's a group, a religious group, whose traditions are not drawn from traditional religions. And uh, of course, most cults are not homicidal or suicidal, but they tend to be rather controlling of their members and have a black and white mentality, the, the belief that only in their group do you have any hope of, uh, of achieving an afterlife. Um, <clears throat> and oftentimes, cults are led by a, a charismatic leader. Okay, um, according to your book, your textbook, what is one of the five uh, ways that people express their religiosity? Hint, these were called the five dimensions of religiosity. You know, know how the... Belief. Belief is one. Another one is ritual. 
Uh, and so um, th there were others. You don't have to know the whole list, but you need to know one of the five ways that people express their religiosity. No, in this case, you don't. Although, as I said before, if, if, if you just didn't get the right word, but you've got a good explanation, it could help you out. Um, okay, your textbook claims uh, that not all people who claim that religion is very important in their lives may be accurate about that. And so this goes to what we call the social desirability bias. If I ask people in a survey how important is exercise in your daily life, and I give them these choices, very important, somewhat important, or not at all important, most people will tend to say somewhat important, even though they don't exercise at all. Why is that? It sounds like a better answer. It's social pressure. Social pressure. It's kind, of, it's kind of hard to, I mean, I don't know it's hard to be honest, but I mean, you have to be honest. Sometimes it's difficult to be honest with yourself. Um, and so, but the same thing goes to religion. In our society, we tend, not, all, not everybody, but there's sort of a tendency to think that some religious involvement is, is good or useful. And so if I just ask people, how important is religion in your life? People who don't even go to church or only go on Easter Sunday will say it's somewhat important. Uh, what's a better way of asking the question? We could phrase it for, ex for exercise. Instead of asking how important is exercise in your daily life, ask how often you exercise. So w w what's the question then for religion? How often do you attend church? Yeah, how often do you attend? Uh, you'd have to phrase it in a way that would apply to Muslims and Buddhists. I, how often do you attend, say, religious activities or something like that? How, how often do you participate? Uh, because as we pointed out, and, and people would argue about this, but if you claim that religion is very important in your life and never do anything re re relevant to that religion, it's doubtful that it is. Because if you say you're a devout Muslim and don't follow any of the rules and don't read your Quran, etc., there, you have to question whether that's accurate or whether it's true. Okay, um, uh, Talcott Parsons, you need to know one of the four major elements of the sick role. Um, so the sick role is, is uh, one element just off the top of my head is that as long as the, the sick person is cooperating with medical professionals, he is allowed to withdraw from work or school and is not considered to be lazy. Uh, and again, this is straight out of your PowerPoints. The PowerPoints, as I pointed out before, are on the Canvas website. So you can go on there and click on it if you're looking for something that you can't find and review that. Um, okay. Um, how would conflict theorists explain the high salaries that physicians make? Um, Basically here, they're arguing that the medical establishment keeps the number of doctors artificially low, so there's quite a bit of, uh, there isn't as much competition, and so they can, they're free to, to uh, and the way they do it is by limiting enrollment in medical schools. Um, so that's basically the, the explanation there. Okay. Um, according to the symbolic interaction perspective, What's the likely socialization effect of nurses in the work world? Basically what they're arguing here is the nurses start out being very altruistic and benevolent. They're bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, and wanting to help people. But then what happens after they work for five or six years in the field? They get jaded and a bit cynical. And, and why? what would be one reason they get a bit frustrated or cynical? Dealing with, with what? Yeah, well, not so much the sick people, but what's... Dealing with, like, insurance companies? Right, the, the bureaucracy and the rules. The, I mean, it's not to say we don't need rules, but there are rules and regulations in the medical field that can be a bit frustrating. Like, for example, um, all the paperwork that it has to be completed and so forth. Um, okay. Uh, <clears throat> you need to know, according to the textbook, what is one of the most co common causes of death among adolescents? Adolescents would be teens, teenagers. What's, the, what's one of the most common causes of death? Car accidents. Car accidents, right. Uh, another one would be suicide. Uh, but car accidents or accidents of generally of any type are, uh, in other words, a, a 16, 17-year-old young man is unlikely to die 
of cancer or dementia or those sorts of things. Um, okay, you need to know, um, according to your textbook, what is one of the reasons that men appear to enjoy better health uh, but they end up dying earlier? They appear to, in other words, they don't, they're not often going to the doctors, so they appear to be more healthy, but they end up dying earlier. Right, and why, why is it that men, uh, according they just to... just neglect their health process. They're so they're socially ostracized from society. Right, they're, well, they're not socially ostracized from society. Well, um, why is it that women are more likely to go to the doctor when they need to, and men, men put it off? Because it's not masculine. Yeah. Right, yeah, it's... it's they're trying, it's not so mass, men are socialized to try to be tough and um, I mean even from an early age if a young, if a eight year old boy is crying too much after stubbing his toe or something, uh, it's a sad thing to hear but sometimes parents will say stop acting like a girl, man up, you know, you, you shouldn't be crying and so they're socialized from an early age to try to be tougher and as I pointed out before, one reason married men live longer is because their wives encourage them to go to the doctor um, and um, or nag them, whatever, however you want to define it. Um, okay, uh, yeah, and as I pointed out before, one of the, the, perhaps the leading killer of men is colon cancer and, um, and, and it is treatable if caught early, but a lot of men just put it off. They put off uh, seeking treatment. Okay, um, you need to know the difference between passive and active euthanasia. Euthanasia, though, is the termination of a terminally ill patient's life. And by terminally ill, I mean he has the disease or illness that, that is causing unbearable pain and will shortly lead to his death. What's the difference, though, between passive and active euthanasia? So passive would be like stop, like withdrawing from support or withdrawing from health, and then active would be like, here, take this pill so you can die. Yeah, exactly. So passive is withdrawing from medical support, basically letting nature take its course. Passive euthanasia is legal everywhere. On the other hand, we have um, active euthanasia, like, do like the Dr. Jack Kevorkian video, and uh, this isn't on the exam, but um, to my knowledge at the moment, active euthanasia is only legal in two states. Anyone recall? One starts with O and the other with W, and they're right next to, no. and they're right next to each other. Oregon and Washington. Oregon and Washington, yeah. So, uh, and as I, also as I pointed out before, the process involved for qualifying for this procedure is rather slow and tedious. So studies have shown that a lot of people, in fact, the majority, end up dying of their disease before they actually uh, qualify for the the, the treatment. Well, call it the treatment, before they qualify for the suicide assistance. Uh, and that's because you have to prove, you know, with three independent medical professionals that, that you indeed have a terminal illness that cannot be, that where the pain cannot be controlled. Okay, um, the pay or play option is one proposal for ensuring universal health care. What is the pay or play option? Right. So basically, if you're an employer and you don't provide your employees health insurance, then you have to pay into a government fund and they, they get their insurance through the government. So you basically have two, two systems, the private insurance and the public government insurance. That's the way it is in Japan. And when I lived in Japan, I got our health insurance through the federal government. And uh, as I pointed out as well, the, one of the big differences was it was a lot cheaper and there were no deductibles or co-pays and I didn't need any referrals to go see other doctors. Um, and it also covered dentistry and vision um, without any co-pays. Uh, although one of the things, I didn't mention this about Japan before, but normally by default in Japan, when you have a, a filling uh, to fix a cavity, they don't use any, they don't numb you up. I just could not imagine, I mean, I, when I went to Japan, I went to a, a Western dentist that had a lot of like American clients because I, I couldn't pos, I'm pretty tolerant of pain, but I couldn't possibly have a filling. Can you imagine having a filling, drilling in your teeth without any 
know if it came, but anyway, I guess if, you, if you're raised in that culture, you learn to deal with it. Um, okay, uh, population depends on three factors. Uh, list and define one of those three. Uh, so population depends on uh, what were the uh, birth rate, death rate, and migration rate. Um, how's the birth rate defined? And it's not just how many babies are born. It's the number of babies born per what? Per 1,000 women. That, that is actually the fertility rate. Um, but the birth rate is just simply the, the annual number of live births per 1,000 uh, women. Yeah. Okay, um, and again, you don't have to know all three, but you would need to know one of those. All right, uh, define the infant mortality rate. And, I, and I'm not saying to tell me what it is, but how it's defined. Anyone know that? That, that's the death rate, but I'm talking infant mortality rate. It's the annual number of... The number of asthma infants under one year of age per 1,000 Right, yeah, so she said it's the number of, uh, of deaths of infants less than one year of age per 1,000 live births. Uh, and by the way, the reason we have a rate is so we can compare. As I pointed out before, if I told you that 50 babies died in Chicago last year and 20 in New York City, it, it, you can't compare the raw numbers. You have to standardize on a base unit of population, and that's the whole point of having rates. Um, okay, um, according to your textbook, what is, what, what is a country that has successfully, in the past, uh, enforced compulsory population control methods? China is one that did that. And as I said before, it's not, it's not, it hasn't been that long ago, but they, they've now rescinded that policy. Uh, but it, they had that for quite a while. Um, okay, define zero population growth. And by the way, this is sort of a way, uh, and a point to make out that sometimes people just more or less resta restate the question. Now, that's okay, but you've got to go beyond that. So if all you said is zero population growth is where the population is zero, or growth is zero, that, that's just repeating the question. Anyone want to define that? So that would be like the same amount of deaths as, as there were births? Right, yeah. Um, so the, the birth rate and the death rate are so similar that the population doesn't decline or it doesn't increase. Um, okay, um, define suburbanization. Suburbanization is a, pro is a process that happens in industrializing countries where there's a tendency for people to move from rural farm areas and move, uh, no, that's, the, that's urbanization. Let me correct this. Suburbanization is a tendency that happens in uh, post-industrial societies where, there's a, where people who used to live in the city move to the suburbs. They may still work in the city, but why would they move to the suburbs? So it's a bit quieter, a bit safer, better public services, et cetera. So it's a tendency to move to outlying areas, sometimes called bedroom communities. Um, and of course, this is in a bigger city. Um, here in Clovis, I don't really think we have suburbs per se. Okay, um, you need to know one of the three characteristics of the zone in transition. This was from, what, Tuesday's lecture. Um, we said that those three are poverty, heterogeneity, and mobility. If I were you, I wouldn't try the heterogeneity because I couldn't spell it myself. No, maybe I could. I'd have to try. Uh, I'm, I'm so used to typing on the computer and it just auto-corrects it, but how many of you can spell heterogeneity off the top of your head? No? <laughs> All right. Uh, so you need to know, you don't have to define them. Um, uh, okay, now there is an extra credit for four points, uh, and I'm not going to tell you the answer because that would sort of de defeat the purpose of it, but you need to know what relative deprivation is. Uh, has nothing to do literally with your relatives, though, um, but you can look that up. Relative, relative deprivation. All right, so that's basically the exam in a nutshell, and like I said before, you'll have as long as you want. And make sure you bring a blue book, too, because that, that will help you out. We, you have to have a blue book to take the exam, and nothing should be written in it. Are there any questions about any uh, things? So this needs to be a, a fresh, clean, new blue book. You can use your old blue book as long as you rip out the old pages that you wrote on. Okay. So if you have room, that's okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Not in the morning? 
check your syllabus. I, someone was telling I me it's, it's nine, 9 to 11.30. 9 to 11.30, yeah. Right. So, um, yeah, so 9 to 11.30, but it's in your syllabus. And um, someone's asked me this, do, do we have class on Thursday? No, once, once the final is done, then you're, you're all done. So you don't have to come back on Thursday. Uh, and, um, and someone else asked me, like, I have a conflict with another exam. We can work around that. It, just shoot me an email and we'll set up a time. Uh, where you can just stop by the office and take it if that is necessary. All right, any other uh, questions? Yeah. I need to take my quiz from last, from Tuesday. Can I take it um, on after my final? Yeah, just send me an email and remind me what, which, what, which one that was. I believe it was the one, the last one, right? The last one you just Yeah, said. so I'll print that out. All right, any other questions? Yeah. The Okay, <laughs> you're asking about something. Yeah. At the time. Uh, yeah, it's Tuesday, May 9 at 9 o'clock to 11.30. All right, any uh, additional questions? Yeah. <laughs> all right, so we'll see you all back then on Tuesday.